So for part B, uh, we're asked to find all x values on the open interval from negative 2 pi to 4 pi, where f has a critical point. And so f is the function g of x minus cosine of x over 2. And so if we're looking for when f has a critical point, we're looking for f prime, and f prime ought to be g prime, and then times the, or well, minus the derivative of cosine of x over 2, which is the derivative of cosine of x over 2 should be positive 1 half sine of x over 2. So we want to know when does that equal 0, or when is that undefined? And the derivative of g, g prime, is definitely undefined at x equals 0, because we have a corner there. So there's one critical value at x equals 0. And then the other one would be when this equals 0. And so to figure out, um, to figure out when g prime plus 1 half sine x over 2 equals 0, that tells us that, let's see here. Um, we've got two different pieces of g. So g prime, we'll say g prime equals 1 from here to here. And g prime, the slope here, it should be negative 1 half. So we're trying to figure out um, between negative 2 pi and 0, where g prime is negative 1, is this ever true? And between 0 and 4 pi, where g prime is negative 1 half, is this ever true? Does that make sense to everybody, the, sort of the starting off point there for the rest of B? Yes. All right. Um, so then we end up with 1 half sine x over 2 equals 1, and sine of x over 2 equals 2. This um, is never true, so we'll just ignore that. And then if we set this equal to 0, we end up with 1 half sine x over 2 equals 1 half, or sine of x over 2 equals 1. And so now we want to know when on the interval between 0 and 4 pi is the sine of x over 2 equal to 1. Well, that's when that angle, x over 2, is equal to pi over 2. Um, could also potentially be at 5 pi over 2. Um, anything beyond that would be, you know, if we did 9 pi over 2, that's outside of the interval 0 to 4 pi. But we still have to multiply this by 2. So that gives us x equals pi and 5 pi. And 5 pi is not on the interval 0 to 4 pi. So the only other critical value is x equals pi. So x equals 0 and x equals pi are the two critical values there. Any questions there on B? Part C says we got h of x is the integral from 0 to 3x of g of t. We want to find h prime of negative pi over 3. So first off, if h of x is the integral from 0 to 3x of g of t, then to find h prime of x, we need to use the first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus, the derivative of the integral from a constant to a function of some other function is just the function evaluated at the upper limit times the derivative of that upper limit. So h prime of x is 3g of 3x. Everybody good with that? Yes. All right, we want h prime of negative pi over 3. So that ought to be 3 times g of negative pi. And g of negative pi, if we look back here, um, this is the graph of g. Negative pi is here. Since we know the slope is 1, that should be a value of pi. So we just get 3 pi. 
any questions there on part C? All right. And then somebody was next was asking um, the first question of number 12. That's 10, 11. This one? Yeah. All right. So the first part of this one. The question is, is f differentiable at x equals 0? OK, so if this is the graph of f, the derivative does not exist here at x equals 0, for sure, because this is a, yes. For one side, it's coming in with a slope here of, what is that? Um, no, it doesn't actually, it doesn't tell us what this lower value is there. So it's kind of, does it tell us what uh, negative four, the value of negative four is? It does not, does it? Okay, that's fine. Um, so we know that the, uh, the limit as x approaches, Well, let's do it this way, actually. So, um, so we can say first off that it's that it's not differentiable at zero because we know that if we look at the limit as h approaches zero from the left of f of x plus h minus f of x over h, as we approach, this is a value that is greater than zero because the slopes, uh, the slope of this linear piece going in towards zero from the left is positive. But if we look at the limit as h approaches zero from the right of f of x plus h minus f of x, this being the limit definition of the derivative, these slopes are, oops, I wrote, yeah, sorry, I did write that right. These slopes are less than zero coming in from the right hand side. And so since the slope on the left is not the same as the slope on the right, they have opposite signs for sure. Therefore, the two-sided limit, this limit, the limit as h approaches zero of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h doesn't exist because both the one-sided limits aren't the same. Does that make sense? Yeah, I was just wondering how you justify it. Thanks. Yep, yep no problem. Yeah. All right, and then um, people wanted to go over the problem from yesterday that I posted. So give me one second here. I'm just gonna need to pull it up so I can put it into this slide. I'm trying to. All right. So here is that problem. Hopefully, you all can see that fine. So I'm just going to go through and do the whole thing. Um, I think that'll help people out for the quiz probably. And um, if you have questions as we go through, let me know. So part A. So first off, um, this is the function f. It's a bunch of line segments and then a semicircle. And g of x is the integral from 0 to x of f of t. So it's the area under the curve starting at 0 um, of this function. So the first thing we want to find is g of negative 6 g of negative 6 is the integral from 0 to negative 6 of f of t dt. But we don't want to go 0 to negative 6, so we flip it and do negative 6 to 0 of f of t dt and just take the opposite of it. So now this becomes the opposite of whatever all of these pieces of this thing are. So this first piece here is we got a base of one and a height of two. One half base times height gives us negative one for that since it's below the x-axis. Here we've got a base of three and a height of two and it's above the x-axis. So that's one half of two times three. 
And here we've got um, a base of two and a height of two, one half of two times two. So we got negative one plus three plus two is four. And we take the opposite of it to get negative four. Everybody okay with part A for the first part of part A? Okay. So for part B, or sorry, not for part B, for the second part of part A, for G of 8, we're looking for the integral from 0 to 8. So that means we need to find the area underneath this from 0 to 8. Well, first off, this area is this. It's not actually the area of the semicircle. So to find the area of just the red, we want to take the entire green and subtract off the blue. So the entire green is eight, it's just a rectangle, four by two, and the blue is just a semicircle, so one half pi times the radius, which is two squared. So that's the area in red. And then we're gonna add to that this little piece that's still above that's triangular. So that's height of two, base of one, one half two times one is one. And then down here we've got base of three, height of two, and it's below, so that's one half of six, but it's negative, so minus three. So we got six minus two pi. Any questions there on the rest of it? All right, part B asks us about points of inflection on the open interval from negative six to eight. So um, we know that we know that in order to have a point of inflection for G, G double prime needs to change size. Well, G double prime is equal to F prime, right? Because G prime is F, so G double prime is F prime. So we're looking for when does F prime change size or when does the slope of f go from positive to negative or negative to positive. And so the slope of f is positive until I get to negative 4, then it's negative. So negative 4. And then it's negative until I get to negative 2, then it's positive. So negative 2. And then it's positive until I get to 0 when it's negative. So 0. And then it's negative until I get to 2 when it's positive. So 2. And then it's positive slopes. When I get to four, it switches to negative so four. And when it's positive, it's negative slopes. So I get to six, and then it becomes positive. So six looks like it has six points of inflection: negative four, negative two, zero, two, four, and six. Everybody good there with part B? Yes. All right. Part C says local maxima or minima. Well, G will have local maxima or minima if G prime changes signs, right? Well, G prime, which is F, just needs to change signs. So we'll just look at when does F change signs. And if we look at the graph, that happens at negative five, and it happens at positive five. The other critical values like negative two and two, it doesn't change signs. It stays positive both of those times. And since it says the open interval, we don't have to worry about our endpoints. And so we know that it's negative five and five. And for negative five, we'll note that the derivative goes from and I, I prime, g prime g prime is negative and then g prime is positive. And here g prime is positive and it goes to being negative. So if the derivative goes from negative to positive, that means that f goes from decreasing to increasing. So at negative five, we have a local min. And at five, it's the opposite. We have a local max because it goes from positive so G increases to negative, G decreases. 
everybody good there with part C? Excellent. Great. Do, end, uh, Go ahead. do the endpoints count? Specifically, we have an open interval here. Oh, okay. So no. If you did not have an open interval, if you had a closed interval, then you would have to think about the endpoints. And so you'd think, well, here G prime is negative, which means that the value of G from negative six to negative five, from negative six to negative five, G is decreasing. And so this would tell us since G is decreasing, that we have, um, yeah, if G decreases, that tells us this is a local max and at negative six if we had a closed interval. And okay, here, yeah, same thing. So same thing over here at eight, you'd have to worry about that here too. Um, because it's negative, we'd have the same, um, because the derivative, sorry, because the derivative of this, of our function G is negative, we have the same thing going on. Uh, does that make sense? How to check yeah. the inputs. Yeah, okay. Cool. All right. So part D, um, so just, just real quick, just because it's going to be important to us. G is decreasing here, which means here at the endpoint at eight, we have a local minimum. So when we go to the next part where it asks for the absolute maximum on the closed interval, we have to check any local, um, local maxima that we had. So we have to check the value of five and we should check the value at negative six and maybe eight, but not eight because we knew it was a minimum. But over here, we were able to determine that at negative six, it was a max. A local max, so we need to check negative six and we need to check positive five. So g of negative six, we already know that value is negative four. We just need to find g of five. And g of five, well, from zero to four, it was already, we already had six minus two pi there. Now we had eight minus two pi there, right? And then we have to add to that, right, this was eight minus two pi in the, the red here. And then we have to add to that this little piece right here, which is one. So we end up with clearly nine minus two pi is more than negative four. So our absolute max is a nine minus two pi. And it occurs at x equals five. Good or no? So for D, if we did the table that we had done on the other ones as our like explanation we don't have to include the ones we know are minimums right correct yep all right I just have a question i have oh. a question in general yeah. like say you did um part a wrong and you got the wrong answer for g of negative six would that impact you in question d as well or would college would stop taking points off um so it would screw you up if this value happened to be the absolute max, because then you'd get the wrong value for the absolute max. But if this was still the absolute max and you said, oh, suppose you got negative three for this and you said negative three, and then this was nine minus two pi and said your absolute max was nine minus two pi, um, you'd be fine. You'd get all the points for part D. Thanks. Yeah, that's cool. Any other questions? <laughs> 